absolutely priceless. Okay, I've been moved by this letter, so I will read it out. I don't normally do requests, but um, it goes as follows, and it's under an assumed name. Dear Chris, I know you don't usually do requests, but I hope my circumstances will move you to exception. I'm 38 years old, I live by myself, and while I do not entirely lack for company, I have no friends of more than four years standing, and prefer to spend most of my time, particularly weekends, alone with my memory, for that is where my true friends are. Four years ago, I was a key witness in the trial of a Wilpshire death ring. Seven men were given life, but in the process my own existence became threatened. Threatening messages on my pager, pig blood in my milk, told me that I'd been marked by the gang, and when I awoke one morning to find a skinned swan in the toilet, I applied for police protection. They obliged, but advised me to move from Blackburn to Kilburn. They also said I would not be safe unless everyone I knew believed I was dead, so with their help I disappeared and headed south. Everything about me had to change, including my name. You may just have heard of me in my old incarnation. Between you and me, but not for broadcast, I used to be called Chollis Ketteridge. I used to run Hot Biscuits, the record shop off Calder Street. I also took the precaution of altering my face so that I would be completely unrecognisable even to my family. Alas, they, along with my true friends and dear wife Alice, could only exist for me in my mind and heart. The first few weeks in London were interesting as a sort of challenge, but to be honest, the longer I spent in my new environment, the less I desired to meet new people. They're all right, but the bonds you make after 30 are so superficial, frankly. It was Alice I missed most. I thought about her every day at least 50 times for three and a half years, and by this January I could feel my wits beginning to end. Then, just six weeks ago, something happened that split my brain end to end. It was a Sunday and I was purchasing some fittings in an all-week furniture store when there, arranging the display in the mid-tone bedrooms, I saw Alice. I knew it was her at once. Every curve, every gesture, I just stood and gawped. No words, just a huge tennis ball in my throat. She saw me, a staring stranger, and looked away embarrassed. I ran out. But two hours later I was back. I wandered about for four hours, showing immense interest in triple futons and portable alcoves, all the time keeping her in the corner of my eye, wondering a thousand ghastly wonders. What was she doing there? How could I talk to her? Would she recognize me? Could she love me again? God, I wanted that. For a week I returned every day, making enough purchases to avoid suspicion, at the same time lurking and peeping as much as I could. She had noticed me again and smiled. Had she looked slightly too long? Christ's fat cock, how I ached. By Wednesday I had gathered she was still unattached, but had three suitors who would contrive to visit her during the day, making her laugh and blush with their vacuous flirting. How men become ridiculous at the hands of bad lust. One of them, the stupidest but most forward, asked her out. I seethed from behind a rather unpleasant shelf. I wanted to shout, Alice, I love you, help me. But of course I couldn't so I scrawled it onto the back of an Odbin's receipt and pushed it deep into my pocket. I was being eaten up. By Thursday, she was playing them off against each other. She said she would go to the lakes for the weekend with whoever could guess the whereabouts of her birthmark. I knew she was just amusing herself, trying to forget me, but still I felt the full bowling in my gut when she said that. But I also knew she'd given me my chance. No one could guess about the small violet disc in the warm pink of her mouth, but I knew. The answer had to be written down and placed in an envelope. They would be opened on Friday lunchtime in the park outside the store. All morning I loitered in the grass, bursting with fear, maintaining an outward saunter, wishing I smoked, muttering at squirrels until at last the improbable foursome emerged, excited and chattering. I watched with glowing glee as first one, then two and finally three faces failed despite their smiles fully to disguise their disappointment. Alice laughed and tossed her hair. This was my moment. I ran forward, thrust my envelope into her hand and said, Please open it. Please trust me. You must open it. They laughed. They pretended to take me seriously. Alice slipped her finger under the flap and drew out my note. She read it and read it again. She looked at me aghast. She looked at her suitors who were now no longer smiling, searching for some clue. But who? Chollis, I said. Chollis Ketteridge, and I love you. I'm not dead. I had to run away, but I don't care if they kill me now. I want you back. After an aching pause, a tear rolled down her cheek. Chollis, she whispered, and leaned forward to kiss me. 
I shut my eyes, but never felt her lips, because at that moment she was transfixed by a spear of frozen liquid waste from an aeroplane toilet facility. I will never forget her face as she lay pinned to the turf, the look of stunned incomprehension tempered still with a slight sensual anticipation is pop riveted to the scarred bonnet of my memory. But you would bring back happier memories if you played Horse With No Name, the cover version by David Essex. The ocean is a desert with its life underground and the perfect skies above. Under the cities lies a heart made of ground but the humans look 